Hello. Today we have Professor John Braithwaite with us as part of the Max Weber Lectures. And uh, we are very happy to have you here, Professor Braithwaite. I'm a Max Weber Fellow-in-Law. My name is Sapna Rahim Shaila. And I also have Svetlana Lebedenko, who's also a Max Weber Fellow at the Department of Law. Professor Braithwaite is known to scholars across different disciplines and different areas. He's a prolific writer. He's written extensively in the areas of regulation, criminology, and peace building. And we are very much looking forward to having this conversation with you, Professor Braithwaite. We listened to you as part of the Max Weber lectures yesterday, and as usual, you took us all by your expansive knowledge of different ideas and gave us an amazing talk. Um, maybe we can start off talking a bit more about how did you become a criminologist? Or what inspired you to be a criminologist? Oh, not much inspiration, uh, but please call me John. Uh, by accident, I would, I would have to say, uh, when I was young, I had political ambitions, and I thought doing a PhD was a good thing to do, that I would learn about policy making and so on. So I did a PhD to fill in some time uh, while I was waiting to contest uh, a seat in the uh, parliament uh, in Australia. It turned out I was an unsuccessful politician, a failed, doubly failed politician at the end, so I stumbled into being an academic. And I ended up doing criminology because there was a, a research grant to support <laughs> My PhD uh, scholarship in, in, in criminology, totally by accident. But I, but I had been inspired uh, by some teachers of uh, undergraduate criminology during my days at University of, of Queensland. And then, I, you know, I was lucky enough to inherit wonderful PhD supervisors as well. Thank you. Uh, and in your own words, uh, you have been taking on bigger and bigger projects and focusing on a longer term and longer haul. And you're one of these rare types of academics who have a lot of experience as a field worker. You have conducted field work in various locations and across different topics. And your ability to combine these things and sort of move between this micro, meso, and macro levels is truly exemplary. And could you please share your advice on how do you construct and carry out projects in the way that they have a huge theoretical value, but also an impressive depth of empirical evidence? Well, I, I, I hope some little bits of that might have a grain, <laughs> a grain of truth. But I do, do think it helps a lot to uh, make friends from other disciplines and uh, when those uh, scholars, some of those scholars become uh, people that you love as you mature with them and work uh, with them to do research projects and get them, uh, get them finished, then you learn about the other field because of your close connection with those scholarly friends from other disciplines. And as an academic, it's, it's good to go on things like the university promotion committee where you get to be involved in reading the CVs of academics in fields other than your own, and there are, there are many of those in the university system. And that, but the thing is that they read you, lead you into enriching scholarly relationships, and that's one of the, uh, one of the pathways, I, I think, to you know, getting better at that big picture stuff. Um, in my own work, I very much start at the, at the micro level. So I, I seek out people in my field, you know, a field like regulatory governance, for example, who are said by their colleagues to be master practitioners of, say, regulatory inspection, and then go and observe them, uh, talk to them, about why they are doing things uh, the way they're doing them, draw inspiration from their own interpretation of what they're doing, and then try to theorize 
that in a, a bigger, more macro way that, than they might themselves, but then to feed that back to them and say, well, what would be your comment on that way of theorising? What it is that you're doing day to day, would you think that's silly? And they, you know, they might say it's silly, they might say it's uh, far too abstract for the reality of the pragmatics of what I do. But if you take responsive regulatory theory, for example, it, it's, a, it's a very pragmatic theory, or it's just the essence of which is try one thing after another <laughs> until you find something that, uh, uh, that succeeds. But, it, but that's, that's the common sense of a lot of that, that those people in a, in a very complex world. We really, a lot of the time, have no idea what will work. But we don't want to suffer from analysis paralysis where we just leave the problem, sit there. We, we just want to try one thing after another until we find something that motivates a corporation or a, a bit of the state uh, to change the way uh, they, be they behave. So they fix the problem, and when it gets uh, fixed, then we use praise as a technique. I mean, praise was something we discovered bottom-up empirically that way. One of the cheapest regulatory strategies there is when, uh, say, a company fixes some environmental problem that's causing the pollution of rivers, to give them praise for it is such a neglected regulatory strategies, but the people who are seen as most effective by their peers do a lot of that. So you observe that and then you theorise that simple idea up into something bigger like a pyramid of supports to get things done through tech, one of the techniques they're being praised. So picking on that last strand mm. that you were mentioning about responsive regulation, do you think your own past as a social activist and as you mentioned earlier to us, as a failed politician, yeah. had, had anything to do with how you came up with this theory? Yes, well, I, I mean, as an activist, you, you aspire to making the world a better place. So... Uh, that's led me with Philip Pettit to develop a view about how to integrate normative theory and, and explanatory theory. So uh, explanatory theory is an ordered set of propositions about the way the world is. Normative theory is an ordered set of propositions about the way the world ought to be. And so Philip and I developed the view inductively through our work, particularly on crime, but other things as well that became a, 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 a body of work where Philip steamed ahead of me and did these profoundly important works on Republican political theory uh, from that foundation. Uh, so we, we would pick on an idea like freedom as non-domination, uh, freedom as the condition of not being subject to the arbitrary power of others as an alternative to a sort of neoliberal version of freedom as just having more, more choices in markets, mm. uh, predominantly. But um, it, it, where that is an energising idea in political theory, in normative theory, we argue there's a good likelihood that it'll have power in explanatory theory. So while I've been enjoying my visit here in EU, I've been talking to people about slavery as a huge macro explanation of why some societies have more crime and war uh, than other societies. Uh, the societies that have the, uh, the histories of the biggest impact of the African slave trade taking more slaves into their country uh, have, uh, 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 through the politics of domination that induces in their society, uh, end up being societies that get themselves into a lot of wars and have high homicide rates, mm -hmm. high femicide rates, 
Um, uh, and so the normative theory idea helps in guiding where to look for productive empirical explanatory theory ideas that end up being empirically supported. Uh, and then there's this mutual reinforcement be between the two. And then once you do that, and you, once you're weaving together the explanatory and the normative, then you've got to address uh, matters of, well, your standpoint, your positionality, how does that affect your biases? How, you know, that's why I would sort of op openly declare that I was a failed uh, Labor Party politician so that, particularly since we, uh, Valerie Braithwaite and I had these early findings showing that countries that had higher social democratic votes, uh, election after election, had lower homicide rates. Mm -hmm. So if you if you if you if you're a card carrying member of a social democratic party uh, if you're covering that up people will get very suspicious of uh, of that um, but of course we look there with interest because we have that political interest and then other people can pick up other data sets and test that uh, proposition and see if it's it's really true or not um, hearing you talk as well as reading your work, it seems to me you're someone who doesn't shy away from engaging with other disciplines or insights from other disciplines. And here at the EUI, we have many researchers who love, who want to do empirical research, but at the same time, sometimes get stuck within the disciplinary boundaries. Yeah. Uh, do you have any tips to give them, suggestions to give them, how to navigate between and across disciplines? Well, well finding congenial co-authors obviously uh, uh, helps a lot. But enjoying reading, you know, discovering what kinds of work from other disciplines you enjoy. I mean, in your own field, you know, we have to be disciplined and read the works that really matter. We have to know the, the canon, even though, even if we think the canon of our field is nonsense, we still need to read it. Um, that's not the case with other people's disciplines. Uh, we can read what we enjoy reading. And that's indeed, in my view, what we should do, because we should, that should be a source of being energised. When we get energised by someone else's work, and so many academics neglect to do this, you write to them and say, I really like, out of the blue, oh, you don't know who I am, kind of thing, but I read your book and I, I thought, I'm not in your field, but I, I thought it was wonderful and it's useful to what I do in the, in the following ways, or here's the way I've uh, cited it, thought you might be interested. Um, and sometimes conversations, relationships, uh, grow from there. So that's not hard to do. And that's also a good thing to do in terms of being generous to other scholars. They get a surprise if you write to them uh, uh, out of the blue uh, and, and say, oh, someone from Australia who's in a completely different discipline from me has read, uh, read my work and found it useful. Uh, that's good all round, I think. Um, now let's go back to your own work. And in your most recent book, Macrocriminology and Freedom, you develop an elegant and yet very powerful idea of freedom from domination as an organizing structure for reducing violence and human suffering. And this work is also an integration of your previous findings. And I wonder if you could reflect a bit on how your insights from your work on white collar crime, and also on global business regulation with Peter Drahersh, played out in this new book on macrocriminology. And relatedly, what is your recipe for possible institutional solutions in business regulation that can help expand freedom and reduce domination? Well, on the last question, I think social movement politics is, is really important, Svetlana, I mean. Uh, uh, P 
Peter and I use the example of the anti-slavery movement at the foundations of that Republican political theory stuff that, um, you know, the, the social movement against slavery was a remarkable accomplishment. I mean, people, ordinary people in British churches thinking slavery was a, a shocking thing in which the Christian church was greatly implicated and missionaries going in to colonise societies on the backs of the following in the slave traders, um, that uh, you know, they got politicians elected to the British Parliament and with uh, Ami de Noir, uh, Noir in uh, France as, as well as a global social movement. But, but the, the, the British Empire was the great power of the time. So the church is getting bills through the British Parliament to ban the slave trade was the really important strategic, and it was the first great accomplishment of social movement politics that became a global uh, social movement. And Peter and I thought saw it as a very instructive lesson because the anti-slavery movement was smart enough to divide and conquer the great powers. So once they had conquered the politics of the greatest power, Britain, Britain began to think the British slaving interests were really upset about the banning of their trade. And British plantation interests were really worried uh, that the plantation economies of other colonial powers would be using cheaper slave labour to beat on price their plantation exports. So lobbied the British states alongside the anti-slavery movement to act diplomatically and even militarily, blowing empty slaving ships out of the water in Rio Harbour uh, to end the transatlantic slave uh, slave trade. So divide and conquer jujitsu of social uh, movement politics, how, how the weak, just these ordinary churchgoers in Britain can mobilise the strong, uh, those who own colonial trading corporations, to join them in pressuring other countries uh, to also ban the, uh, ban the slave trade. And there have been a number of examples of that throughout history that Peter Drahosh and I worked on in the Global Business Regulation book. And we, we took that as a big starting point and you know, showing directions for how we could have a more networked governance of business misconduct that's less reliant on weak states and where, at times, strong social movements that, that are strong because they have global organisation uh, uh, can actually have victories against states. So now that we are talking about your work, um, I know that one of your current work is comparing peace building strategies across mm. different countries. Based on your preliminary findings, do you have any suggestions, guidance that you would like to share with peace builders who are working towards ending ongoing conflicts in many parts of the world now? Yeah. Well, I, I think the most important thing, Sapna, is that local wisdom is the wisdom that matters. And it's no use for us as scholars of peace building to develop templates and say, this is some sort of, there's a policy optimization of some kind in, in this peace building temp template that is, is my brilliant creation, scholarly <laughs> creation, so this is what you, uh, you ought to do because what ought to be done is always going to be different for every armed conflict and local knowledge and wisdom has to, has to create the ideas what we can do is convene 
scholarly communities where, you know, Colombian peacemakers talk to Timor-Leste peacemakers, talk to South Africans, talk to people in Iraq and so on, uh, and reflect upon what's been done in other places. But what we're going to craft for our peace process is always going to be different. So I'm not not a fan of the of the template or, or or marketing a template, as it were. But there's no doubt that there are some empirical findings that researchers of, of, of our kind can point to. People are cynical about UN peacekeeping, for example, because they've read stories about they've seen the movie Black Hawk Down and they they know about the Rwanda genocide and the, the disappointments of uh, how the peacekeeping operation uh, performed there. So there, there certainly have been some spectacular failures of UN uh, peacekeeping. But statistically, across all peace operations, you know, peace operations that are a success are, and peacemaking that's a success is of a lot less interest to people than failures. Like at this moment of history at the moment, you know, we've had two new major wars operating uh, that were huge, probably both involving uh, similar numbers of hundreds of thousands of deaths so far, and that's the war in Ethiopia and the war in Ukraine. Uh, the war in Ethiopia ended with a peace agreement which everyone thought was wildly implausible that negotiation of a peace, a peace agreement could happen, uh, but it did happen, and the war has ended, and it's not a topic of any great conversation uh, in the Western media, uh, a context where peacemaking is not working well at all. Uh, Ukraine is the central topic for, for some very good reasons, geopolitical reasons. It's, it's a central topic of of conversation, but we have a, I'm, I'm describing an unbalanced empirical understanding of what works with, uh, with, with peace building. And, you know, we know that what works, uh, we, we know that it's very unlikely uh, for a peace agreement to succeed unless there have been a dozen attempts at a peace agreement that have failed before, you know, you, we learn from each failure. This also goes back to the point, we, we don't have any template of how to do it right. What we need to do is try different strategies, one after another, a bit like the story with responsive regulation, with business regulation, uh, uh, actually. But statistically, overall, uh, we know that the effectiveness of UN peacekeeping in reducing, uh, uh, increasing the prospects of, uh, and peace agreements in, in ending wars and peacekeeping uh, and peace building, then reducing the prospects that there will be another war. And the best predictor of there being a war is whether you've just had one. So uh, that's important. Uh, it, it, it works. You know, Paul Collier and her team submitted a uh, uh, an argument to that competition that the economists run of what would be the most cost-effective use of scarce public resources for improving human well-being and economic well-being. And, uh, you know, UN peacekeeping, you know, it was a bunch of Nobel, Nobel laureates in, in, in economics picking the winner and their submission from Oxford University resulted in UN peacekeeping being uh, selected. And by the way, the data show that when it's a UN peace operation, mm -hmm. it's more likely to be successful than when it's a peace operation run by some particular state, for example, a particular great power like the United States or Russia. That's not a great formula for success. So we know a few things and we can uh, join in conversations on those things, but there might be contexts where the UN, the UN Security Council just can't be persuaded to go in and someone else is persuaded who does a very good job, like the African Union. 
in the case of uh, Ethiopia. Mm. Um, you also mentioned to us um, in our discussions earlier about listening to others, and this is a quality that you emphasized for empirical researchers, and it seems to me it's a quality that you also tend to emphasize for practitioners or peacekeepers or politicians. Um, can you share your thoughts on that? Like how would deep listening or listening to the other side could help in creating a better world, maybe? Mm. Uh, my beloved partner Valerie says that I'm not always a great practitioner <laughs> of, uh, of deep listening. Uh, that notwithstanding, uh, uh, yeah, I think it is a key to so many things that if only people will listen in the sense of, especially in, in, in the early stages of moving toward a peace agreement, to instead of saying, well, that's all very well, but what we think is, duh, and then disagree, to instead just repeat back to them. So what you're saying is, duh, 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 duh. have I got that right? And sort of proving to your enemy that you are listening deeply, that you're genuinely interested in hearing back as to whether you've fully understood the complexity of their position. I think that is a key to the art of successful uh, peace building. And as my wife tells me, successful marriages uh, and, and all, all sorts of successful uh, uh, human uh, activities. And we, we forget that. Um, you know, and, Academics generally aren't very good. You know, I'm a restorative justice guy, but I'm a terrible restorative justice practitioner because I've been ruined. I mean, I mean, because restorative justice is a practice of seeking to achieve justice through deep listening, empowering of stakeholders, and transforming a conflict. Well, you know, being a university professor for decades is terrible training. Uh, for that, because you spent your whole life talking at people. Uh, that's not the skill needed. So when I go into school classrooms, I always say to them that there'll be someone in this class who'll be a much better practitioner of restorative justice than me, partly because that child will speak your language and understand your culture of this school. But also that second point, because I've been ruined as a deep listener as a but we, we we university professors have to keep trying to improve our listening skills john we know that you are currently working on a very ambitious project on devising simple solutions to complex catastrophes i wonder if you could share with us what your future book will be about and which simple solutions you have to offer. Well, uh, uh, thanks Svetlana for that bit of marketing. I have to write the book now. Um, uh, deep listening is one of those simple principles and uh, the way I'm thinking about that book is that you, you get on the list of simple solutions by being a generative solution. So the idea that deep listening is important and what's the difference between deep listening and just sort of pretending to listen or just sitting there listening, uh, that feeding back point, uh, you know, is, 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 that's not a very complex idea, but it's generative, generative of a lot of complex problem solving if only you would fully, deeply tune in to the complexity of the other. So I'm interested in the, the dialectical uh, movement uh, from the simple solution that transcends. Oh, there's a lot of analysis paralysis out there in the world that, you know, the world is so complex, the world is so scary that there's nothing that little me uh, or my little institution uh, or my little NGO can contribute to it. No, we've got to believe uh, in our own power to advance some simple ideas that might help. 
But when they, uh, th when they prove to be simple-minded, uh, we, we need to pull back from them and we need to then shift in the dialectic of how we get things done to, to a, more a complexity theory. And I'll say, you know, responsive regulation, a responsive regulatory pyramid is an example of a, a, a somewhat more complex theory that says it's a complex world out there. So most of the remedies we, policy remedies that we put in place to try to fix the problem are going to fail. So that's why we have many layers of the pyramid. We try this, it fails. Then we try something else, then we try that. And we have a view about how we order things. We, we don't want to try oppressive things first, but at the peak of the pyramid, we might do something oppressive like put someone in jail or, or, or start shooting at someone. Um, uh, but that, that's the ordering principle. We want things that are less invasive upon the, the freedom of others to be lower in the pyramid and try to solve problems like getting them. So diplomacy before war, for example, restorative justice before locking people up in prisons would be another example. But it has that complexity of moving. But, but at each layer, you, you have a pretty simple approach. Like restorative justice, let's sit in the circle, uh, let's uh, listen to our different views of what happened, who was harmed, and then what might be done to repair the harm, what might be done to ensure that it will never uh, happen again. Um, uh, so that's 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 pretty simple, but uh, it will fail uh, a lot of the time. That doesn't mean you give up on the simple idea, by the way, because um, you know if we think of criminal prosecution and sending people off to jail at the top of that sort of criminal justice regulatory pyramid, uh, I mean we can fit people sending them off to, to jail. They partly because they've been in jail, they then re-offend, they come before the court again, we send them to jail again, and we do that to them perhaps four or five times in the course of their, of their lifetime, and no one says, I'll oh, stop doing it because it's not working, or well, abolitionists do, um, but most people don't ask that, that question. People always ask that question of restorative justice, or here it failed in this case. Well, that doesn't mean you don't try it again. Like with business regulation, we had some... Uh, one of the things we learnt, I, I, I worked uh, as a regulatory commissioner with our National Consumer Protection and Antitrust Regulatory Commission in Australia for, for 10 years. And in our ex experimentation with restorative justice on business offences, you know, we'd sit in a circle and there'd be a manager who was, in our view, as the regulator, primarily responsible for this decision to breach the law. And that person, naturally, will often be a tough nut who is into the business of denial and has their highly paid lawyer sitting beside them, advising them, uh, you know, let them, let them prosecute you. You might win, and even if they win, they won't get a very big penalty for that, so tough it out. So the restorative, for that reason, because of that legal advice, and because the person wants to defend their own responsibility for the wrong thing the corporation did, the restorative justice fails. So then we would, we, we would say at the end of the conference, well, we're really disappointed that you don't want to respond to this genuine concern we're raising with you by admitting responsibility and taking active responsibility for putting things right into the future, for compensating uh, victims, for putting new compliance system in place. That's what we expected you to say, and we're disappointed that didn't happen. But look, let's just both go away and think about this and think about what our next step will be. So, then, uh, you know, the next step is not to escalate the prosecution, the next step is say, we're going to convene another conference and we're going to invite um, his boss 
into the conference in the hope, well, sometimes he'll be, the boss will be an even tougher nut than the primarily responsible uh, executive. But in one case, I remember so well early on, we, we, we went all, all the way up to the chair of the board and when he came in the circle, and we had reason for thinking that he might be pretty upset if it was drawn to his attention. He was kind of the patriarch of this firm that had you know, transformed it from a small business into a big business. And indeed, that was what happened. He was very upset at his uh, CEO for responding to a, a reasonable concern articulated about breach of the law by a respected regulatory agency and not saying, we want to fix this. We want to compensate our consumers. We want our, we want our customers to trust us. Uh, and the chair said, well, this is how I would have expected um, my CEO to react and I'm really disappointed that our company has not responded more positively. He fired the CEO, which was not a real restorative thing to do, but not inappropriate in the circumstances either. Uh, and then all of those reforms were put in place, including reform, in that case, uh, putting in place monitoring mechanisms to make sure their competitors didn't take advantage of them by playing the same games with the consumers that uh, they had been making money by, uh, uh, by playing. So that's the restorative justice idea is that you can move up the, uh, the pyramid by expanding the circle rather than by moving up to more, uh, more punitive responses. You, by expanding the circle, you hope, you hope ultimately you'll move to expanding the, the the, the circle to the point where there'll be a genuinely socially responsible actor who sees injustice as something uh, uh, that hurts uh, and, uh, uh, and, and therefore as justice, that something that, that ought to heal and restore. Thank you so much, John. Uh, and we came to our last uh, question. So summary of what we've talked through these couple of days. Your work deals with some biggest real world struggles, yet the message of hope is always there. And I wonder if you could share some advice to early career researchers who enter the field in rather gloomy times. Yes, they are gloomy uh, times, and it, it's hard to give a satisfactory answer to that question. I think it, one answer came up earlier in the discussion that uh, in the short term, things look uh, very uh, gloomy. Things do look very gloomy for peace building in Ukraine, but, but that's where we have a role in the academy of pointing to the fact that, all right, you say if there was a peace process between the conflicting sides in Ukraine, it would fail because there's no goodwill or commitment to making a peace work on either side at the moment. Both sides think they can win a war. That may be right. And that may be a, a source of kind of dashed hope. But the politics of hope resides in saying, well, that's perfectly normal in an armed conflict. That was normal in Ethiopia. Um, but if you just try and try again and deeply listen each time, learn from why the peace process failed last time, try a somewhat different strategy of transformation uh, next time, involve some different players in the circle, have a different relationship between track two diplomacy and track one diplomacy, diplomacy where it's just the, as it were, the hard-headed principles in the room and uh, and peace diplomacy 
where all sorts of uh, uh, creative NGO social movement people uh, are in the room. But sometimes uh, you've got to narrow the circle in a peace process, so just the people who control the guns are in the circle because they've got to reach a really practical agreement about guns. Like, what's the hour, the minute, the day when we're going to stop shooting in this ceasefire? Where will the con cantonment uh, of these troops be? And who will guard the perimeter to make sure these troops don't break out and return uh, to the battle? But even if you have those moments of narrowing the circle of conversation about how a step, a meaningful step toward peace might, might occur, you want to keep, you still want to keep expanding the circle out for very good strategic uh, peace, peace building reasons. So seeing the whole process of moving from failure to failure to failure to partial success to partial success to a permanent peace uh, and that it's natural to fail and learn so you know uh, uh, fail first fail fast and learn slow kind of thing um, is uh, the fact that we're learning all the time gives us hope I think thank you John it was really a great pleasure to have this conversation with you and learn from your wisdom. Thank you for your wonderful work and we hope to have you again at the EUI in the future. Well, thank you for your splendid questions. <laughs>